Hi, welcome to Compass Church. We are so glad that you're joining us today, whether it's here with us in person or in your living room or wherever you're watching from. Our mission is navigating people to God. We're one church in multiple locations, and one of those is right where you are. Here's what you can expect from the next hour. If you're here with us in person, feel free to grab some coffee out in the lobby and drop your kids off in our amazing Compass Kids ministry. Also, there's a mother's room located behind the Compass Kids check-in. Today, we get a chance to express our worship through music and song. Now, this isn't a performance. The band is not putting on a show for us or a concert. Rather, they're leading us in corporate worship so that we can encounter Jesus together through music. Feel free to join in however you want to. If you want to stand, raise your hands, sing, you're free to engage however you're led to. We are also going to take part in something called communion. Now, this is a really special time where we get to reflect and remember that Jesus came to earth to die for our sins. If you're here with us in person, we have communion cups for you in the back of the room. Or if you're part of our Compass at Home family, feel free to use whatever you have available to you in place of the juice and bread. And finally, we're going to hear a message spoken by one of our pastors. Now, we love to interact here, so feel free to give a amen or a that's good, however you want to engage. If you're watching online, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section, or you can interact with one of our amazing online chat hosts. We are really glad that you're here. We're getting ready to kick this thing off, so let's go. Church, let's stand, let's worship together. Put our hands together. Just full of your love, you never fail to so 
Thank you so much for worshiping with, worshiping with us this morning. My name's Sarah. If I have not had the chance to meet you yet, I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And hey, if it's your first time, welcome. We're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. There are a couple of ways that we can get connected with you. If you would text Connect RO to 94000, there's a real life person on the other end of that line. We would love to know how we can serve you and your family and maybe pray for you. Also, there's a QR code at the chair in front of you, so you can scan that and get, uh, fill out a Connect card for us. Another way to get connected here at Compass is through Starting Point. Starting Point is our awesome four-week class where you learn about us, we learn about you, and how you can get connected here. It happens every Sunday at 10 a.m. There's no need to sign up, you can just show up. So next week, maybe skip this service and go to Starting Point and get connected. That That's allowed. You can skip church to go to Starting Point. That's okay. We count that as church as well. So join us for Starting Point. Hey, you guys, it's not warm today. However, it's starting to warm up, which means summer's coming, and we're so excited. That means we have summer camps approaching, and we have lots of spots closing, so you want to make sure you get in on those registrations. We have summer camps for kindergarten all the way through 12th grade, so you want to check those out for sure. I want to spotlight our Windshape Camp for elementary kids. Windshape Camp comes, and they transform this whole building. It looks nothing like it for the whole week, but we need your help. We need volunteers to pull it off. We need volunteers from setup to tear down, whether you can serve one morning, two mornings, three days, all five days. We would love to have you help with lunch, check in, set up, tear down, like I said. And so if you would like to register your camper or register to volunteer for Windshape, you can go to compass.church slash camps and do that. I would also like to tell you that for our student camps, for middle school and high school camp, I know we are really running low on spots. So if you have a student in middle school or high school, please go on and register them soon. They do not want to miss this. It's an eternity changing camp week for them. So make sure you register your middle school or high schooler for camp. We are so excited about what God's going to do in the next generation this summer. If you would stand and we're going to continue to worship together this morning. Amen. And church, we just came here today to worship the name of Jesus, to hear from him and to be close to him. And I just want to encourage you as we continue to worship. I want to encourage you, for those of you who came in this room, maybe carrying a burden today, that God is with you, that we serve a God who does not leave us. He doesn't look away from us. Things that are hard for us are not hard for him. And he wants good things for you. He has good plans for your life. So let's remember that and remind ourselves of God's goodness as we continue to worship today. Let's sing this out together. From the beginning, you've been unchanging. 
age to age you stay constant you remain every mystery the questions i've carried are safe within your will so i trust you even still
Church, we're going to move into a time of communion. So grab your communion cups, and if you don't have one, if you'll raise your hand, we'll bring one to you right now. And if you are at home, run to your kitchen, grab some juice and grab a cracker and come back and join us. But we believe in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The name that has the power to save, the name that has the power to heal. We believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross and he rose again. And now he sits at the right hand of God our Father. And in him we find freedom, in him we find salvation. And there is so much to be thankful for. And so as we take communion, we take a, a piece of bread or wafer that represents the broken body of Jesus. And we take some juice that represents the blood that he poured out for us. And as we take this, we say thank you. So take a minute on your own time. Tell him how thankful you are for what he's done in your life. And let me pray for communion. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for going to the cross for us, for the forgiveness of our sin. Thank you for the freedom that we have in your name. Thank you for the healing that's found in your name. God, we lay our burdens at your feet today. In Jesus' name we pray. And on that day of wrong my race, I finally see you face to face. And nothing then will separate, I believe. I join with every tribe and tongue and bow. Just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. And I'm sorry when I've come. My agenda, I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Yes, I do. I'm caught up in your presence. And I I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. 
is Brandon Beard and I have the great honor of serving here at Compass as one of our executive pastors. One of my responsibilities is helping care for the church's finances and staff and teams and most weekends during our generosity moment we tell you how the money that you give is being spent uh, on a maybe a specific missions partner or on a local Compass ministry and we celebrate that. We, we go on to tell you week in and week out thank you for your generosity and we mean it. It is sincere because Compass literally does not exist without your generosity. But today, for those of you in the room that wanna know a few facts about Compass and how things are going financially, we have a couple of numbers for you. Our goal here at Compass is we wanna be very transparent when it comes to money. Here in Roanoke, it takes about $1.7 million to operate this campus uh, per year. And that's about 32,000 per week. That pays our incredible staff, who I know you experience the amazing difference that they make in your community. This covers things like our mortgage, uh, our utilities, and, and all the money it takes to do ministry here locally. Uh, you are giving here in Roanoke at a rate that's much higher than about 30, it's about 30% higher uh, than our local Roanoke budget. And that helps us so much. It helps us contribute to costs of supporting our outreach partners. It helps cover the cost of our teams that serve all of our campuses, like communications and HR and finance and facilities and it helps pay down the debt on this property. It also helps us dream about things that we wanna do in the future, like more kids space for this campus. To the 384 families and individuals who have given here at Compass Roanoke over this past year, can I just say thank you. To all of you who are new to Compass or have yet to try generosity here, I wanna invite you uh, to give it a try because Compass is at its best when we're all involved. With over 600 people baptized at Compass in 2023, and over 250 baptized in March, God is clearly moving at Compass, and your investment is directly helping navigate thousands of people to God. If you ever have questions about generosity or about finances and how money is spent here at Compass, we, we want your questions. We're happy to answer them. Reach out to myself or one of our team members. As many of you know, there are three ways to give here. You can give online, uh, you can give using our app, or you can also use the black generosity boxes that are in your building as you leave today. To our campus pastor, Josh Wright, and the entire staff at Roanoke, thank you for leading so well. Thanks in advance to every one of you for your generosity. And as our lead pastor, Drew Sherman, always says, 
Our best days are ahead. Thank you so much for being such a generous people. This campus would not exist without your generosity, so thank you so much. As Brandon said, there are three ways that you can give today, and I would love to invite you in generosity with us. You can give online, you can give on the Compass app, that's how my family does it, or there's also black generosity boxes in the back of the room. If you would, I would love to pray over our offering and over the Roanoke campus. God, thank you so much for all that you've done and all that you're doing here at Compass Roanoke. God, I thank you for every person that's given, Lord, and that, God, you would just take all of our gifts and that you would just multiply them so you can do abundantly more. God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the reason why we exist in navigating people to God. I pray that you would continue to use us as an outpost to the community. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Compass. So honored that you are with us. Uh, we're one church in many locations. And so I want to say hi to folks joining us from all over online today. Uh, would you let us know if you're joining us online in the chat section uh, before you sign off how we can pray for you? Uh, that'd be great. If you're in the room and you're new or relatively new, make sure you stop by our guest table in the lobby. It's right up against the glass wall when you walk out the doors here. We've got a small gift for you. And we'd just love to shake your hand and say hi before you leave today and answer any questions you might have about Compass. Uh, before we jump into week three of our series, called uh, Creatures of Habit. Let me just uh, kind of cover a couple of things. Number one, he's gonna hate me for this, but Mitch, Pastor Mitch just celebrated his 63rd birthday on Friday <laughs> and uh, he's wearing it well. So you guys make sure to high five him, love him. We appreciate him, couldn't we do what we do without him here at Compass Roanoke. And um, I just wanna celebrate our worship team for a moment. Guys, we are in, it's an embarrassment of blessings and riches that we have in talent and heart here. And uh, I told Anna and Elisa, if they sing like that every week, Jesus is gonna come back sooner. He really is. So can we just give it up for our worship team? Aren't they amazing? So great. So grateful for them. Okay, so my family and I recently celebrated our fourth anniversary here at Compass. And uh, for the most part, it kind of feels like time has flown by. Um, we have had an incredible season of ministry. Our church has nearly doubled. We've seen hundreds of baptisms. Our youth ministry has tripled. I mean, it's just go on and on. Groups, we've, I mean, we have 10 times more groups than we had um, just four years ago. We've been through a lot. We've been through a global pandemic. We've been through um, a crazy election season, social uh, tensions. I mean, it's just been wild. Uh, but for the most part, it's just been better than we could ever possibly imagine. There is one thing, however, that I do want to just mention to you um, I, that I personally have been struggling with. I have been struggling with um, what the past four years of ministry has done to me physically. Um, in fact, I want to show you a picture of me when I started here at Compass just four years ago. So today we're gonna to talk about lying. <laughs> Pamela Meyer, the author of Lie Spotting said, on a given day, you may be lied to 10 times to 200 times. My guess is 10 if you live in Texas, 200 if you live in Washington. <laughs> Americans lost $151 billion to fraud in 2023. Most strangers lie three times within the first 10 minutes of meeting each other. Um, according to a University of Massachusetts study, 60% of people can't go 10 minutes in a conversation without lying. Extroverts lie more than introverts. I always knew we were more godly than you guys. <laughs> Women tell more altruistic lies, not wanting to hurt someone else's feelings. Men lie eight times more than women do about their own lives. The average married couple lies to each other one out of 10 interactions. Um, this isn't new. We start this really, really young. Babies fake a cry, pause, look to see who's watching and then start crying again. One-year-olds learn concealment, two-year-olds bluff, five-year-olds will look you right in your face and lie to you. Nine-year-olds are masters of the cover-up. Teenagers lie of choice is omission. And by the time you're in college, you'll lie to your mom one out of five interactions. 
So to quote the great philosopher Buddy, you sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> and these lies destroy. They destroy marriages, families, careers, relationships, confidence, trust, peace. They destroy our own self-respect. So there's an interesting conversation Jesus had in John chapter eight with some Jewish leaders who had started to believe in him and started to follow him. He said, it says to the Jewish leaders who had believed in him, Jesus said, I, if you hold my teaching, you're really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So this is one of those statements that if it is true, then the inverse of it is true. So if you will know the truth and the truth will set you free is true, then you will know lies and lies will keep you in slavery and bondage is also true. And so in verse 33, it says, they answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? And Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in the father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. So Jesus right here would have stopped them in their tracks. Um, he basically just called Abraham a liar, right? They said, our father's Abraham. And he says, you're, li you're, you're liars. So, I mean, they would have wanted to kill him for this because Abraham was like holy to them. So they argue with him for a few more verses and then skip down to verse 44. It says, you belong to your father, not Abraham, the devil. And you wanna carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. At this point, the disciples would have thought, Jesus is gonna get us killed. And he is out of his mind because this is the worst possible way they could have insulted these people by calling him, by calling them sons of of Satan, the father of lies is your dad. I mean, this was the worst insult ever. And so I started thinking about that phrase, father of lies. Jesus in just two chapters later would say that Satan has a mission for your life. He has a life, Jesus does. It's that you would live life and life abundant. But Satan, the father of lies has a mission for your life too. And it's to steal, kill and destroy your life your family's life, your children's life, your marriage, anything you possibly can. And so if I were the father of lies, what would I do to destroy your life? Well, I think I would do four things. I think the first thing I'd do is I'd get you to believe a lie. I'd get you to believe the lie that you should be afraid because you lie when you're afraid. That's when we lie. We lie when we're afraid. We're afraid to get caught, so we lie. We're afraid to look dumb, so we lie. We're afraid of not being accepted, so we lie. We're afraid of not being enough, so we lie. We're afraid of not having enough, so we lie. We're afraid of rejection, so we lie. We're afraid of loneliness, so we lie. We're afraid of failure, so we lie. Sometimes we're afraid of God, and so we lie. And so I want you to think about all these things I just said. What do they have in common? Well, I think all of them have in common at their very root three statements that we say to ourselves, either directly or indirectly in our subconscious. Three statements. I am not enough. I do not have enough. And I will never be enough. My friends, I would submit to you that every time you've ever told a lie or every time you've ever been lied to, it has its roots in one of these three statements. I am not enough. I do not have enough. I will never be enough. So this is why Jesus is so frustrated and angry with these religious teachers, because they are propagating these three, lot, these three questions or statements in the form of a religion that says you should be afraid of God. When it comes to God, you're not enough. When it comes to God, you don't have enough. When it comes to God, you'll never be enough. And so their solution to this predicament was more commandments. Was, was more religious performance, was more platitudes. And people could never feel like they could ever make God happy in their system. God was always angry and always mad and we are always dirty. 
Now, if you just go back to the beginning of this chapter, John chapter 8, this is when a woman was caught in adultery and these religious leaders brought her to Jesus and said, the law says you should stone her and kill her. And Jesus said, no, 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 woman, I don't condemn you. He wrote something in the sand. All the religious leaders left and Jesus stood the woman up and said, go and sin no more. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live in slavery to this sin. So look at what Timothy tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Now, if fear is the root of all lies, I want you to think about when you have lied or when you've been lied to. When someone lies to you, it's probably because they are afraid that they're powerless. When someone lies to you, it's probably because they're afraid that they're unlovable or that you won't love them if you find out what they did. When someone lies to you, it's because they don't have a sound mind because they feel like things are out of control or not within their control. And so Timothy is telling us the antidote to deception, the antidote to lie is to get rid of this fear that you're not lovable. It's to get rid of this fear that you have no power over sin. It's to get rid of this fear that everything's out of control and God's mad at you and is gonna let your life come to ruin. That is not from God. That is from the father of lies. God has given you a spirit that is of power and love and of a sound mind. And so John, the same author of John 8, we read a minute ago, would go on and say in 1 John chapter 4, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Th think about that for a moment. What he's telling us is that eventually there will be a day when you and I will be judged. We will be held accountable for what we did with our one and only life. But John is telling us, you don't have to be afraid of that day. If you are in Christ, you can be bold on that day because your sins have been washed, cleansed, and forgiven. Now, what does he, what does he say next? Because as he is, so we are in this world now. So he's saying, look, Jesus walked on this earth as a son with no fear that God didn't love him or that God was withholding from him. You can walk the same way because the forgiveness of your sins and the freedom God has for you is not just for the day of judgment, it's for now. You can walk as a son or a daughter now. You can walk in power and love and a sound mind and self-control now. Because, verse 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Who told you? In other words, who told you that you had to be afraid of the God who loved you enough to die for you? Not him. That's from the father of lies. And so my guess is, my guess is that when you have been lied to or when you are tempted to lie yourself, it's because we don't believe this. But friend, you can know and believe the love that God has for you. You can know it. You can be confident of it, James tell, uh, John tells us. God's love is not contingent upon some future perfect version of you that figures it all out. God's love is not conditional. It doesn't come with strings attached. He doesn't love you because you're religious or is known, knows enough Bible verses. He loves you because you breathe air. He loves you because you're his son and you're his daughter. And it's not something you have to wonder about. It, it's, it's a fact. It's not, it's not a puzzle to put together. It, it is, it's already there. You're already loved. You, you don't have anything to be afraid of, child of God. You are lovable and you are loved. You are enough in Christ. You may not be enough for her and you may not be enough for him and you may not be enough for that company. They may have passed you on by, they're lost. You are enough in Christ. 
My Bible tells me that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're enough. You have nothing to prove, Christ follower. Nothing, absolutely nothing. What title could anybody ever give you that's greater than the title son or daughter of God? What accolade could this world ever throw at your feet that's better than your sins are forgiven, you've been bought with a price, and one day you'll see your king face to face? What could the world ever say about you that's better than that? You have nothing to prove, absolutely nothing to prove. God is for you. God is not against you. When, when life doesn't go the way you want, when, when, when the relationship ends and you wanted it to continue, when the job doesn't happen, when things don't go the way you want, God is not withholding. God is not angry. God is not mad at you. God's, God's not up there waiting on you to put the right puzzle pieces in place of doing the right deeds and praying the right prayers and showing up at the right time so that some safe in heaven unlocks and you get what you want. That's superstition. That's not grace. God's not angry. God's not mad. Who told you God was mad at you? The father of lies did. And so my guess in, is, is that in most of our lives, when we lie, it's because we don't believe these things. So the next time you're tempted to lie or the next time someone lies to you, stop a moment and ask the question, where's this coming from? And my guess is, my guess is it's coming back to one of those three statements. It's all centered around fear. Where do I feel like I'm not enough? If, I, if That's where I'll lie the most. Where do I believe that I'm not enough or I don't have enough? That's where I'll lie the most. Where do I feel like I'll never be enough or never have enough? That's where I'll lie the most. And that's where people will lie to you the most. It's fear. Because we feel the need to protect ourselves, to be our own source of provision, to control others and the world around us. But control is not the language of love. Control is the language of fear. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love doesn't need to control the narrative and paint a false picture of who I am to get you to accept me. I don't live for acceptance. I live in a place from acceptance. My father's already accepted me. I don't have to go around looking for acceptance. I've already got it from the greatest source of acceptance that has ever been or ever will be. If you accept me, great. If you don't, great. Either way, I'm good. God does. I don't, I don't live for that. I live from that. So I don't have to control the narrative. I, and listen, this is amazing. When I don't have to control the narrative of what you think about me, I'm free to just love you. No strings attached. I'm free to just let you be who you are and let me and be who I am. No judgment, no condemnation. And that's when you'll actually tell me the truth and be vulnerable. That's the key to intimacy right there. It's truth. It's truth. But deception erodes that. So what would I do? I'd get you to believe a lie. Number two, I'd get you to lie. I'd get you to speak my native language if I were the father of lies. And it's got all kinds of dialects, like partial truth. Partial truth is a full lie. It is. Uh, there's a movie from the 80s. That's how old I am. There's a movie from the 80s, and uh, in it, it's a movie called Something's Gotta Give, and it's Diane Keaton and Jack Nicholson. And in the movie, um, Diane Keaton catches Jack Nicholson cheating on her with another woman in a restaurant. And so she runs out of the restaurant, and when she runs out of the restaurant, he chases her, and when he catches her, he says, I've never lied to you. I've always told you some version of the truth. <laughs> to which she says, the truth doesn't have versions. It's either true or it's not. But we live in a world where the truth has so many versions that we don't know what the truth is anymore. And that's the goal of the father of lies, friend. What Satan wants to do is to get you to take a spoonful of 75% truth and 25% lie and swallow it like it's all truth. That's what he wants to do. I can't tell you how many people sent me articles when the eclipse happened 
and said, look at all this. This just proved Jesus is coming back. Here's this Bible verse and this Bible verse and that Bible verse and all the cities in Texas and all this stuff. People say, you gotta preach this, you gotta teach it. And I said, well, the Bible verses are true, but everything else is rubbish. You're not reading it right. Go back to the beginning. And, 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 and that's kind of comical and silly, but this is the world we live in. You can't turn on the TV and know what's true. You can't read a newspaper and know what's true because we come, become so comfortable with lying. And we, we're not, um, listen, we're not uh, innocent, we're culpable because so many of us will just hear something, say something, see something, repost it and re-say it without even checking to see if it's true or not. It just makes my candidate look better. So I'll repost it. It just makes my agenda look better. It just makes what I want to be true look better. And it makes you look more wrong and me more right. Who cares what Snopes says? I get to decide we're no worse. We're, we're the same as I'll live my truth. Reposting that mess is the same thing. So don't get all over the people who say, I'm just gonna live my truth with your, there's only one truth, it's the gospel. If you're reposting malarkey all the time in the name of your political or religious agenda. Okay, off the soapbox, Josh, back to the word of God. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's lies. What about slander? You, you woke up for this. What about slander? You got dressed and did your hair for this. What about slander and gossip? Proverbs 17, four says, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip and liars pay close attention to slander. Have you ever had somebody say something about you that was completely untrue? to everybody. Don't you wanna take them outside and sandpaper their eyebrows off? It's the worst. It just does something. Proverbs says it, it says a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. It just something happens when people slander you. It just feel, it's the worst. I would rather you punch me in my mouth, honestly, than lie about me behind my back. So let me put this as blunt but as graceful as I possibly can. Are you a person who talks down about people all the time? Do you talk down about your boss, your coworkers, your employees? Do you talk down about your family, your kid's teacher, your coach, your doctor, your in-laws? I mean, I could go on and on and on. How's that working for you? Does it make you feel better? Is it building those relationships? Is it building that other person? Listen, I'm not saying all this to make you feel shame or I'll let some other preacher peddle shame. That's not who I am. I'm saying this because this is the plan of the enemy for your life to get you caught up in this mess. Because what it does is it isolates you from people. It keeps you distant and, is, and, and dark things grow in dark, lonely rooms. The dark room is where little negatives become pictures. Look at what James said about this. He said in James chapter three, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praises and cursings. My brothers, this should not be. I want you to notice he doesn't give any qualifiers for this. You can't come to Jesus and say, but he's a Democrat, but she's a Republican. But he's fill in the blank. There's no qualifiers here. It doesn't matter what they, they align themselves with politically. It doesn't matter what they align themselves ideologically. You may not agree with them. And in your head, you might think they're an idiot. But the minute you open your mouth and start telling all your friends behind their back you're an, that they're an idiot, you're now a sinner, a slanderer, a gossip. Not just, you're not gossiping and slandering a Democrat or a Republican, you're gossiping and slandering a daughter or son of God made and created in his image and likeness. And we do this about the church. I'm guilty of this. We do this about the church. We just bash the bride of Christ and just run her under a bus. Listen to me. You punch me in my mouth and say anything you want to about me. You talk about my wife, don't let these skinny preacher legs fool you. We're going outside <laughs> and I'm gonna win. I'm from the South, buddy. I ain't playing fair. <laughs> but we, we justify it like we have some sort of religious high ground because we're Christ followers. No, Christ followers' high ground is the low ground, friends. That's, that's who we are. We don't win by being served. We win by serving. 
So let's just, and, and listen, James was soft. Look at his brother, Jesus. Red letters, listen to what he said. Matthew 12, he said, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, but an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up within him. I tell you that every one of you will give account on the day of judgment for every empty word you've spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. That's red words, man. That's not the gospel according to Josh. That's Jesus' words. He takes this seriously. So I wanna be a person who builds other people up and if I can't build them up, I'm just not gonna say anything. That's who we gotta be. That's who we're called to be. What about cheating? <clears throat> when a student cheats on a test, he's lying. When a salesperson declares more expenses than he incurred, he's lying. When someone falsifies expenses on their tax return, they're not smart, they're liars. <laughs> what about exaggerating? How big was that fish, buddy? <laughs> just, just how many yards did you run in that third game on your senior year? Oh, 640, okay. Yeah, I'm sure your wife believes you. When you overstate the truth to look good or convince somebody else, you're lying. Maybe you're upset with a neighbor and you go to that neighbor and you say, everybody in the neighborhood's angry with you. And nobody, you've not talked to anybody, you're just angry at him. And you wanna leverage that hyperbole to make him feel worse about himself. Friends, this is desperate housewives. This is not kingdom of God stuff. This, Paul, Paul's, Paul says in, in one of the gospels, in one, in one of the epistles, he says, man, you're still, you're still drinking milk over here and you should be teaching people and, 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 and eating steak. You, we, when I was a child, I did things like a child, but when I grew up and became a man, I, I, I'm a man now. And I put that stuff away. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't have to, I don't have anything to prove. Why do I need to exaggerate? What about silence? Uh, maybe you hear something that's not true and you remain silent. Well, I didn't lie to you, I just didn't tell you. Well, you may not have told them a lie, but purposely leaving out important information is misleading. To know the truth and not speak it is a form of lying. It's complicity by passivity. What about broken promises? We don't think of broken promises as a lie, but it, it is. When we, whether we promise to pay a debt or promise to take our kids to the zoo or promise to be faithful to our spouse, when we don't keep our word, we're lying. And listen, I don't think we're lying because we're wretched, horrible, bad sinners. I think most of the time we lie when we break our promises because we're not comfortable with our own limitations. So we don't have any boundaries in our life. I wanna open up the, the, the jacket and see an S on my chest. So I'll just tell you, sure, we'll hang out Friday. Sure, we'll go do this. Sure, I'll go do that. Sure, I'll pray for you. Sure, I'll come over. I don't have any intention of doing any of that stuff. I wanna sit on my couch and veg out because I'm so fried because I don't appropriately manage my boundaries and my time. So Jesus started all this way back in the very beginning with the, the Sabbath, and it wasn't a, a, an attempt to just force us to do what he wants. Sabbath was a gift. It was God saying, listen, I know you, I made you. There's an end to your energy. There's an end to your ability to spin all the plates. And if you don't understand that and live within your limits, what you're gonna do is overextend yourself and have to break promises. So we do this with our energy, we do it with our time, we do it with our money. And most of the time, you're not lying because you're a terrible person. You're lying because you've not dealt with the root thing inside of your heart that makes you more comfortable with lying than telling the truth. It's hard work to deal with all that boundary stuff and why I don't have them. It's hard work to accept my limitations and live by them. It's hard work to say no sometimes. It's difficult. It's difficult. But, but the opposite, the, the alternative is to, to, to lie and to be known as a person who says they'll do something and never does it. So if I were the father of lies, the third thing I'd do is I'd get you to lie to yourself. I heard a story about a woman one time who introduced her 24-year-old daughter as 35. And the daughter said, why did you tell him I was 35? And she said, well, I've been lying about my age so long. I figured if they figured out how old you were, they'd figure out how old I am. I had to lie about you. Some people are, are just... And we just lie to ourselves so long, we convince ourselves that the lie is true. This is what David did, David in scripture. It's, it's just this whole idea of the rules don't apply to me. And David did that. So David was king and the king was at, this, at a certain season was supposed to go to war, to go to battle. David didn't, he stayed home. Now David had the tallest roof in all of, of Jerusalem. 
And there was a certain time of day when women would go on top of the roof to bathe because that was the time that the water was hottest. David knew what time the women bathed. So he goes up on top of the roof with the intention of being a peeping Tom. And he sees a woman named Bathsheba taking a bath, which is hilarious. And he says, I want her and I'm the king, I can have her. So he has his men go get her, he sleeps with her, she gets pregnant. He gets guilty. He calls her husband, Uriah, in. He starts to talk to him nice, like, hey, pal, hey, buddy. No, and he just slept with this this man's wife. And he sends Uriah onto the front lines of battle so that he would certainly die. This is how he covers it all up. So he's got this incredible web of deception in his life, and he's got this guy named Nathan, who's a prophet of God, who comes to him and tells him a parable. He says, David, I wanna tell you a story. He said, there was a, uh, a very poor man who had one sheep and he loved the sheep so much so that sometimes the sheep would lay down beside him and fall asleep. I mean, it was his prized possession. His whole family loved it. There was another man who had hundreds of sheep because he was so wealthy and rich. And a, vill- a traveler came to their village and asked the wealthy man for a sheep. And the wealthy man went and stole the one sheep from the poor man, killed it and gave it to the traveler. What should be done to the wealthy man? And David slammed his hand down the table and said, that's despicable. That man ought to be put to death. And Nathan says, you're the man, dude. You took the only thing that man had. And the reason you did it is because you were lying to yourself that you're above the rules. You justified your own deception with your title. You justified your own deception with your desires. But man, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm busy and I work all the time and I, you know, I, I, I don't have a break. And so I come home, everybody goes to sleep and I just get on my phone and before you know it, I'm two hours in to a bunch of websites I know I shouldn't be on, but I'm exhausted. God knows I need a, need, I need a release, man. I just need to feel good for a moment before I go to sleep. I get it, but you're lying to yourself if you think that it's not hurting anybody because it is. I'd get, you, I'd get you to lie to yourself long enough that you're living a lie. That's what I'd do. Lying in its simplest form is to keep someone from knowing the truth about something, and sometimes that something is us. So we claim to be one thing, but we, we live a, in a way that we're something entirely different. It's the college girl who's got an amazing life on Instagram, but she's fighting depression and discouragement every single day, and nobody knows it because she's got to keep up the gram life. It's the mom who has it all together, Pinterest mom. Everything matches and everything is perfect, but in real time, she's worn out and isolated and exhausted and won't tell anybody. It's the husband who doesn't tell his wife how much he spent, hides his browsing history and deletes his texts. It's the couple who has the perfect marriage on the outside, but they're sleeping in separate beds because they can barely stand each other just keeping up appearances. It's the Christ follower who looks great on Sunday for an hour, but the rest of their life is falling apart and they don't want anybody to know because they're afraid they'll be rejected. It's all fear. And I have seen so many people's lives crushed because of this fear. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we become people who are truth tellers? Well, I think we got to understand the weight of deception. Look at what Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3 says. It says, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. What What does this mean? It means that to God, it is more important that you get the area of integrity and character right in your life than you get your worship right. To do the right thing is more important than sacrifice. He's t- it's talking about worship here. To God, it is more important that you get the matters of integrity and honesty and character right down in your heart than it is you give in an offering in a church. That's what he says. So what am I going to do? I think there's four things, and we're going to go quick. Number one, I'm going to come clean to God, and I'm going to do damage control with others. 
Look at what 1 John 1, 9 says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Here's what you need to know. You, we don't confess to God because God needs our confession. It's not like God's up there angry and this is the, the thing that'll flip the switch and make him happy. We confess to God for our own benefit. God doesn't need my confession. I need the freedom that comes from getting it off my chest and giving it to him. So I confess to him and then I'm gonna do damage control with others. Look at what James chapter five, verse 16 says. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. He's not talking about physical healing. He's just talking about inner healing, relational healing, mental healing, soul healing. That's what it's talking about. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna confess to God for forgiveness and I'm gonna confess to you for healing. I'm gonna make sure these, this relationship's right first because this is where I'm gonna get my strength. This is where I'm gonna get my freedom. And then once this relationship's right, this relationship's right. This is why, this is the cross. Vertical, horizontal. I'm gonna get them both right. And that's how I'm gonna find healing and forgiveness. I'm gonna do that very intentionally. When I come to you and ask you to forgive me because I've lied to you, I'm gonna do my best to do it face to face. I'm, I'm gonna try my best not to do it over a text or an email or a carrier pigeon or Western Union telegram. It's gonna be me and you at a coffee shop. And I'm gonna be sincere in that apology. I'm not gonna justify it. I'm not gonna say, well, listen, man, hey, I, I want you to know something. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been in a hard season, man. I, I had a lot going on at work and just been stressful and money's tied. And, and so I want you to know, um, well, I told you something that, that man, I, it, may, it, it, may not have been, it, may, it may not have been true. That's not a confession. That's not an apology. That's you wanting to get the guilt off of your own heart so that you and that person can act like you never lied to them. That's, no, when, when I come to you and I confess to you, I'm not gonna justify it. Listen, man, I lied to you. I'm gonna look you right in the eyes. I lied to you. I didn't tell you the truth. And I'm so sorry. And you deserve to feel however you feel. I want you to know that I realize what I did is hurtful and you deserve better. And then I'm gonna put a pin in my mouth and I'm gonna let you say whatever you wanna say without interrupting you. That's how, that's, that's the anatomy of a real apology. That's what it looks like. The second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the hard work of earning trust back. Trust is earned in raindrops. You can, now you can ruin it with one kick of the bucket. You tell one lie, you can pour the whole bucket out. But if you wanna earn back trust, especially if you've lied to someone, deceived them, done it wrong, it's, it's gonna take time. It's gonna be hard, hard, hard work. And you gotta commit to it. You gotta, you gotta, you wanna be a person of truth, you gotta do the hard work of restoration. Number three, I'm gonna give somebody permission in my life to call me a liar when I'm lying. Now don't, don't call me a liar when I'm not lying. I already told you what I'd do to you if you did that. But when I am lying, call me a liar, call me out. And this is why it is so important. We talk about this over and over and over again. You gotta be in community as a Christ follower. We're really anybody. Christianity is a private decision, but it's a public lifestyle. Look at what um, Corinthians 10, 13 says, 1 Corinthians. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. So, so you're not alone. You're not the only liar in the room. Look at your neighbor. She is too. God is faithful though. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Listen, a lot of people think that what freedom looks like, what freedom looks like is I just come to God and tell him I've sinned and, and then he'll just make the, 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 the liar in me go away. What freedom looks like is I just come to God and say, God, forgive me, I'm dealing with this addiction and he's just gonna, the addiction is gonna be, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and be free. That's not how it works. Most of the time, the way God gets us free is in relationship with other believers. Most of the time, how it works. Most of the time when I've got something going on in my life and I need God to move, his answer is a brother or sister in Christ to walk alongside me and help disciple that thing out of me. So, so this is why you gotta be in a group. You gotta be in a Bible study. You gotta go to Rooted. 
it, it, we, just, we just can't do this part of freedom and deliverance on our own. It just won't happen. And you'll get mad at God when he doesn't deliver you. And he'll say, what about all these people I put in your life to try to help you? That's another form of deception. I don't need help. I got it. The last thing, number four, I'm going to make the decision to be a truth teller. I know that's not easy. I know sometimes it might be uncomfortable to tell the truth. But if you're gonna start walking a path of honesty and integrity and to be the person you actually desire to be, then we, we can't be people of deception. We can't be people of slander. We can't be people of gossip. We gotta know our triggers. What's going on inside of me when I'm tempted to lie? I gotta deal with that thing to where lying now becomes more uncomfortable than telling the truth. I gotta stop justifying my dishonesty. Everybody lies from time to time, but if I'm gonna become a person of truth, a truth teller, a person who speaks freedom in life, I've got to get to the point in my life where I stop justifying and saying it's okay for me, but not okay for everybody else. Qualifying it with all the stuff in my life that gives me permission to, I'm done with that. I'm just over it. Not because I'm afraid of God and not because I'm afraid of you, but because I'm loved by God and love's language is truth because I love you and love's language is truth. I don't want to set up a table for two with me and you at dinner and have the enemy of our soul bring out a third chair and make it a party of three. Let's be truth tellers, life speakers, edifiers. Let's build each other up. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray for my friends who are just wrestling with this fear of you. Somebody told them at some point that you were angry. Somebody told them at some point that they weren't enough. Somebody told them at some point that they would never be enough and they would never have enough, that you were withholding, that you were a puzzle to figure out, that you were an angry, mad God. You are good and your mercies endure forever. And so I pray a fresh revelation of your love on my friends' lives. I pray that they would begin to walk, that we as a church would begin to walk in a place of acceptance, not as people who need acceptance, we've already got it. The world can't take away from us something we've already been given to by you. So help us to be people of character and integrity. Help us to be truth and life speakers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Would y'all thank Josh this morning? couple of things before you go. If it's your first time here and we have not gotten to meet you yet, meet us out at the guest table. We have a special gift we'd love to give you. We also have a few more books of Creatures of Habit if you're interested in purchasing. That's also by the guest table. Otherwise, you guys have a great, great week. We'll see you next week.